For Year of Artist, I had a chance to interview uh, Elizabeth Lev, the art historian from Rome. She was visiting the Twin Cities, and she talks to us about what is art, what is beauty, what importance is beauty in our lives, especially as women, some of us at home with small children or, or working women, what is it that we need to get in touch with uh, as an artist and with great art? So enjoy this interview with Liz Lev. We also talk about her book, which is wonderful, uh, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith. Enjoy. Welcome, Liz. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's very generous of you to work us into your schedule while, while you're here in the Twin Cities. Um, it's Year of the Artist for Wellward Moms, so you're speaking to women across the country. What would you say to women? Why do we need art? Well, I think all people need to believe in beauty. I, I think um, uh, one of the things that everybody will vividly remember is the way everybody in the world was glued to the television set when uh, and the beginning of Holy Week of 2019, uh, Notre Dame was burning up. And this sense of loss, even though you realize nobody seemed to be able to articulate what the loss was, but at the end of the day, it was a, a, a hope and trust that we, play, we place in what Pope Benedict XVI would would describe as authentic beauty. Now, men need beauty, of course, but I think beauty has a particular resonance with women. One, because uh, from time immemorial, we hear descriptions of the beautiful woman, right? So this, the power of beauty that women possess, it doesn't matter which tradition you look at, but there is a, there is a great tradition of the power of beauty. And in fact, when they designate a goddess for desire, for love, it is, it is a goddess. And so um, the, uh, the, the women have a particular uh, capacity as custodians of beauty. They have a sensitivity towards it. They, they, they give life, so that is the most beautiful thing there is. And of course, uh, we have as our model the most beautiful human being to ever have existed, which is the Virgin Mary. So I think we have a, women have a particular resonance towards towards beauty, um, but uh, unfortunately in our modern age that concept of beauty, authentic beauty, true beauty has been a little bit hijacked and turned, not a little bit, a lot bit hijacked and turned into a sort of constant superficial substitutions. So a, a prettiness, a cheapness, an attractiveness, a, a, something that doesn't resonate deep and something that doesn't help to transform one. It, it, I often put it to my students, if you are sort of sitting around in the dorm room with your pajamas and you know you haven't you know brushed your teeth and done your hair yet and in walked you know what either Scarlett Johansson or Chris Hemsworth depending on which student I'm talking to you would straighten up right away you don't you you are aware of the fact of what you know a beautiful person a beautiful person does to you and you how you want to be seen by someone like that now imagine if it doesn't depend on your pajamas and whether or not your hair is done, but the beauty that's within you that you can draw out. And that's, I mean, that's when we start talking about authentic beauty. Liz, you talk about beauty, and I think we're confused about beauty in this day and age. Like, you're, you might think this is beautiful, but I don't. Is beauty objective, and, and why, do we, why do we need beauty in our lives? Dostoevsky said beauty will save the world. Can, can you speak about this? I think in our age of self-determination, we like to be able to say we decide what's beautiful and what's not beautiful. Um, but I think, again, using the example of Notre Dame, uh, virtually everybody uh, uh, understood that that is a beautiful building. Without even being able to tell you, oh, how much does it cost? Some people ask, uh, um, uh, what's in it? That's not it. It's that building is beautiful. What makes it uh, beautiful is the... Uh, common contribution of many different peoples from many different strata of society, all in one building that was protracted over the years. So there's a sense of sacrifice towards that beauty. So many people who worked on that cathedral knew they'd never live to see it done. So there's a sense of self-sacrificing, giving to something greater. And then that works together with the creativity of the actual workers on the building who are developing new styles and new ideas as they're going along and feel that 
that, that energy of creativity which is harnessed to something that's not going to go in someone's living room. It's going to be there hopefully for posterity. So there's a, there's a real sense of, there is a sense of objective beauty. The people who made a point of uh, uh, poo-pooing or suggesting that it was a good idea that the cathedral burned, they still couldn't attack its beauty. They didn't like its meaning, they thought it was an old thing that had been around for too long, but they couldn't quite touch the fact that it was beautiful. And they have nothing, nothing to substitute with it. So what, what else, is, and it's an objective fact, the Iam Pei Pyramid versus the Cathedral of Notre Dame. <laughs> you might want to talk to people who think that the Iam Pei Pyramid is more, it's more people, it's a, that's a rejection of beauty. That's a, a different idea, but it's a rejection of uh, this kind of commonality that, that beauty pretended towards something greater than ourselves brings. The most depicted woman in the history of anything is a stay-at-home mom. Right? So the Virgin Mary is seen in 100, different million, 100, 100 million different guises. Whatever she's doing, she's always doing something. Uh, she's, she's part of her devotion entirely to her child, right? Her entire, we don't, Mary didn't go to work in the morning. Mary's work, her life, everything was concentrated on her son. As a result, she became um, the greatest focus of creativity. So what I'd like to divide up is the sort of the need to, I, you know, I need to paint to become an, it should, one shouldn't feel that somehow you are lesser because you don't have a creative impulse. Your creative impulse comes out in, you know when it's coming out. You may be the world's greatest cookie baker, you may be really good at organizing kid parties, you may be fabulous at decorating rooms, figuring out what to do with space. I mean, there are a million, your garden, there are a million ways that someone's inner creativity comes out. It doesn't have to be in front of a doesn't have to be in front of a you know easel. Secondly, it doesn't necessarily have to be a creativity that's that's constantly applauded. I mean, in many ways, that the humility of creativity is uh, is a very important part of it. I mean, these these artists that we look at from the 13th century, 14th century, a lot of them we don't know their names. Not until we get to Italy do their name. There's this Wilton diptych who who made it a ah, Wilton master. <laughs> And so a lot of the times that, that creativity is sort of, if you're struggling to be known as creative, you're going to create frustrations, frustrations for yourself. And, um, and then a reminder that if you're not feeling like you must, you don't feel the impetus to make things, to create things, first of all, you've, you've already created a family, so you're good. Um, and that Mary herself really becomes in her person, in the way she, uh, 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 she dedicates herself to her son, allows her son to flourish, creates the setting for her son, his friends, his groupies, all the other people. She is the locus of creativity. And so there are different ways of being creative. Liz, I know you wrote a book uh, for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation and, and a Catholic response to that through beauty, through art. Can you tell us about your book and why you wrote it? The, the book comes out of um, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which was in 2017. And the way that, in particular, the Catholic world was leading up to the, this anniversary. And what we see in the Catholic world, I think it's, I think nobody would negate this. We see a lot of division in the Catholic world, and a division that's uh, a little bit more worrisome to the faithful than perhaps a few years ago. So we feel a little bit more of a fever pitch of division. The way the Catholics speak to each other over certain questions has become highly polemical and, and often uh, not spoken with love, but with a great deal of just sort of, uh, 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 sort of angry position taking. And, and, the, and, and the, the significance of all of this is, is it's very, very similar to the situation that Martin Luther drops the 95 Theses in back in 1517. And so uh, this, this rallying to different sides of a question create this tremendous division. 
And one of the ways the church responded to that, uh, understanding the danger of division, one of the ways the church responded to that was to start producing works of art that would be, uh, uh, that would be ways of teaching and persuading. So at the same time as the Protestant Reformation, we also have the printing press. So you have the Protestants who are brilliant with the printing press. They're great writers. They're great headline writers. It's, it's, they're, they're very, very well done. The Catholics are not, theology is not something that lends itself to sound bites. So the Catholics instead start using images and they start to actively promote painters and, 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 and works of art that will uh, persuade, frame, illustrate, and make people feel excited about the ancient tenets of the sacraments. So the book is divided up into a section on sacraments, a section on intercession, and a section on cooperation, sort of the three main bones of contention, and then looks at works of art that the church produced so that we could have peaceful conversations about why we believe what we believe. Oh, that's beautiful. So, you know, is it, how, how would, a, uh, how would a, a mother in her home with her children use this book? Well, um, it's, a, it's a great way to understand how to explain through pictures really fundamental aspects of the faith. So the first part talks about images regarding communion, two sections because the, the sacrament of the Eucharist is so under heavy fire, so is the sacrament of penance. Um, the idea of what it means to be, have friendships with the saints in intercession, so saints as role models, but saints as friends, uh, saints and the, how they teach us to have relationships with Christ. So each section is really, it, it, it comes out of a class I taught. I mean, it comes out of teaching at Duquesne University, Baroque Art and Architecture for 18 years. So it really is organized in a way that the students should all recognize it. Well, okay, yeah, that's that's class one. <laughs> the, uh, but the other thing is, and I would strongly suggest they, uh, the, the women watching this go to the section on the dignity of women in the third part of the book and meet the artist who I think uh, will become uh, a, a great friend to your, uh, to, to your viewers. Um, her name is Lavinia Fontana. She is not well known and she's not well loved by mainstream art history because although she was the first professional woman painter, she was married to a man that she loved and who helped and supported her. So as she was painting, they had 11 children and he helped her taking care of the children. He painted the backgrounds of the pictures for her when she got busy. And, and they lived this very, very, very happy life in which her paintings of herself were always domestic. You see her in the home. She wasn't, she wasn't out places. She, was, she, she worked from home. She was tremendously successful. She was courted by kings, popes, princes, and cardinals. First woman to produce an altarpiece huge success story and at the same time a successful wife and mother which is why art history has no time for her, but you guys should lavinia fontana in how catholic art saved the faith the impetus of that book is turbulence in the um, 16th century in the faith in the state of the church in the world in general but when you asked me to uh, write about or to think about the age of julian of norwich i again discovered that oh what do you know we made beautiful things in very dark and turbulent years and so the thing I the thing I really have, have, have come to enjoy about these projects and learning about the world via art is that we the church faces very very difficult times and moments when the faithful are confused and angry and it seems like everything is going wrong and we might as well just all imagine that it's end times but in the midst of that the church has always succeeded in producing something beautiful. And that's what that's our our sort of visual physical signal to hope. So once upon a time we produced beautiful mosaics or beautiful churches or beautiful paintings or beautiful sculptures. I think now uh, in this age the beauty we've seen obviously the 20th century was not marked by beautiful art 
but we were marked by extraordinarily beautiful people. So we have among us, among the saints that we remember in living memory, we have a Mother Teresa, we have a, we have a John Paul II, we have these exceptional people whose lives are beautiful. But I think the thing to remember is that in the, even when it seems dark, in, in moments of turbulence, the, the church is constantly able, in one way or another, to produce beauty. And we just need to keep looking for it and keep realizing that it does exist, it is real, and it's worth investing our time, energy, and affection into. Do you agree with Dostoevsky? Absolutely. Beauty will save the world. <laughs>